Today we're talking assembly tables. Assembly tables are a real nice add-on to your workshop. The problem is a lot of us just don't have the space for it. So we tend to use our workbenches, maybe outfeed tables for other tools can be used for assembly. And then also, of course, the floor. I've assembled many a project on the floor. But if you do have the space and the desire, building an assembly table that's dedicated to the task is really the way to go. Over the years, I've built a number of assembly tables just depending on my shop situation. The very first one, pasta power. <laughs> was pretty much a copy of David Mark's assembly table that he made on Woodworks, and it featured a torsion box top. A torsion box is nothing but a grid structure. Think of like a honeycomb structure, almost with two skins, one on the top and one on the bottom. And it's supposed to give you a dead flat surface that stays flat and resists warping. Great idea, cool concept, total overkill for woodworkers. Now, if you wanna build one, we still have the plans. If you really think that you want a dead flat surface that's very large, that's a great way to do it without spending a ton of money or resources. The thing is, I just don't really think it's necessary anymore. And for me personally, I want something a little more utilitarian. The reality is the flatness I need comes within a small area. Over a large area, if there's a little bit of you know, dips and valleys across the surface, it's not really gonna affect the work I do. I'm not building spaceships here, I'm just building furniture. So I don't think we need to put that much effort into it, but you certainly can if you want to. So that said, when I looked around our new space here at the firehouse, we've got a lot more room. I actually intended on doing assembly in the second bay. This is the smaller bay where we're at now, but with a CNC coming in with the laser here and the finishing we plan to do on this side, also the wood storage, we're kind of just running out of room on this side. And I think an assembly table would do great in the main woodworking area. And I've got the perfect spot for it. Now, I didn't originally think this was gonna be possible, but once my tools were in position, I realized I had a 11 foot span here between the jointer and my miter station, plenty of room to fit a big, just indulgent four by eight assembly table can go right in this area here. It'll give me additional storage. It'll give me places to hang more clamps, but most importantly, a nice big work surface where we can assemble our projects. So I got wood. There it is. Let's take a look at it. So we're gonna start building the base first. And what I have here is some Southern yellow pine, just construction grade material. And this is from the local home center. Now, I've never actually had access to Southern yellow pine before, but I've heard it works pretty well for shop furniture, things like workbenches. It can be an inexpensive way to get big pieces of material. And even though it says it's pine, it actually is quite durable, uh, especially compared to Douglas fir or the white pine that we might normally have access to as construction grade material. So I picked some of this up. You'll notice the boards are pretty wide. Now I've designed this entire base to be constructed from standard two by fours and two by sixes. So if you just wanna get off the shelf material, you could totally do that. Mine are wide and there's a specific reason, not just because they didn't have Southern yellow pine and two by fours, but also there's an advantage to going a little bit wider and then cutting it down. A lot of these boards, and especially two by fours, will include the very center of the tree. That point right there is known as the pith, mostly because it pithed you off. Huh? So by purchasing a wider board and then splitting my pieces off from that, I can actually get this pith completely out of there. Now, the reason we wanna get this out of there is because the pith is generally the least stable part of the tree. And if you include that in a board, you tend to get quite a bit of warping around the area of the pith. So it's best to just not have it included at all. So we'll cut it away. All right, so I think that's enough rambling. I can now start to lay out the various pieces and make the cuts. Keep in mind, if you bought your two by fours and two by sixes off the shelf, you got a lot less work to do. I'll start by cutting the parts to rough length to make them more manageable. One of the drawbacks to southern yellow pine is that it can be a little bit unstable. So as I break the pieces down, I'm leaving myself some extra room to correct any warping that might occur. A quick jointing of the edge, and then I could rip the pieces to final width at the table saw. Now I can cut the parts to length at the miter saw. And now we can assemble the legs. Now the first thing we're gonna do is bring our leg pieces together. Uh, the legs are comprised of a uh, two by six joining up with a two by four, essentially. And we'll put them together at a right angle like this. Now, of course, these pieces just very unlikely they're gonna be totally flat. I do have some clean edges on there, so that's nice. But when I go up against this edge, no doubt about it, I'm gonna wind up having some discrepancy. So 
If you're going to use screws with this, you don't have to, but if you want to, the screws might be really good at holding it in place so that by the time you get to you know, two screws in, by the time you get to the third one, you might be able to clamp that and force it so it's nice and flat and rides against this straight edge nicely. I just don't think that's really that important at this point, so I'm not really gonna worry about it. I can try to correct some of this with my clamps, but if it doesn't go perfectly, I'm not too concerned. So uh, let's get a little bit of glue on here. And we will be using screws on a lot of this project, but this particular part of the project, I think that glue joint is gonna be plenty strong. Now as I tighten it down, inevitably, it's gonna to wanna to shift. So you may have to reposition your clamp a couple different times. I like to apply just a real light amount of pressure, just a little bit. So you're kind of squeezing the glue out, getting the air out of the joint. That should help get us where we need to be. So now once I get most of that air out of there, this joint becomes a little more sticky and the pieces don't slide around quite as much. It just takes a few seconds to get there. Okay. Now we could set that aside to dry, get a couple more clamps, and we've got three more of these to do. Now we're gonna do a little bit of assembly. This should go fairly quick because it's just glue and screws and all the parts are pretty much cut to size. I do recommend that you maybe keep your laptop or iPad around or print out a picture if you wanna go old school. Keep this around so you can understand the orientation of the work pieces. If you get confused, you may wind up gluing these asymmetrical legs on the wrong way. Um, so the way I'm doing this is kind of imagining this right now as being my front left leg. And I look at the picture, decide on the orientation, and that tells me where everything goes. So I have a very long rail here, and we're going to glue and screw this guy in place. Now, if you look closely, I've got a couple of marks here. These are not measured, just approximate to show me where I'm gonna apply the screws and then glue on this face should be enough to hold that. The one thing you wanna be real careful with, and hopefully if the ends of your pieces were cut at a nice 90 degree angle, shouldn't be a problem. You wanna double check for square because if this thing is not square, you're gonna send this rail off at an angle. That's not gonna be good for the stability of our top. So when I bring the square up to my edge, that's looking pretty darn good. Now, if it isn't, you wanna be careful. Maybe consider applying one screw and then rotating it slightly, getting it square, and then drop that other screw in place. Squareness is gonna be key to this thing working out. So let's get started here. Just gonna line it up and double check. Yeah, that, that looks pretty darn good. All right, so I've got my countersink bit all set up. We're just going to pre-drill. This stuff is pretty soft, so when I drive a screw, I'm gonna go even deeper than the countersink, but that's okay. Just keep that in mind when you select your screw length. All right, so I'm just gonna apply some glue here where the two pieces are gonna meet. It'd be kind of sloppy here. This is not fine work. And since this is my front left, I've got my two by six, which would be on the side, and my two by four on the front face. Just kind of rock that back and forth a little bit, spread that glue out. It should start to grip quite nicely. I will take a clamp and try to find the space between the holes so I could still drill, drive my screws. Just another opportunity to check for square. And now I've got two and a half inch screws. You could probably use two and a quarter. Two and three quarters might be pushing it. So I think two and a half will be good. After that first screw is in, double check for square. See, I'm a little bit off. A little bit of uh, action on the screw is enough to kind of maybe move things around a little bit, so. Still square, so that's good. All right, let's move on to the next one. Now for the bottom rail, we are going to use a little block here. It's about three and a half inches. That sets our spacing from the ground. You don't have to do this. You could just measure and mark. It's not super critical, but it's nice to just have one less thing to worry about. So I'm gonna clamp that in place and we'll use this on every one of our legs that we attach rails to. Get some glue down here. I've already got my holes pre-drilled and my screws in place. Also keep in mind with these pieces, everything isn't dead flat. We haven't jointed and planed all these surfaces. So if things aren't dead perfect, you gotta expect that. This uh, two by six just may not be flat. So we're just trying to do the best we can to get it as square as possible. Booyah! All right, so to get that other leg in place, I think we can just take this homeboy, drop that down, and now we can work flat. All right, so now for this one, everything is uh, laid down on the bench. We can grab these two pieces and just bring them in place like so, but let's do some drilling first.
You know what would help on a project like this? A nice big assembly table. All right, and the final thing we need to do with this one side assembly is add another leg here at the center. This one is kind of optional. I think I'm gonna have a substantial amount of weight on this bottom shelf at some point in the future. So I do want that third leg to provide that extra support. So same rules apply. We want the spacing to be good down here. We want to be flush at the top and we want to be centered. So I've just drawn a couple of center lines and center lines on the actual leg pieces that will help me stay aligned. So let's go ahead and do the pre-drilling. You might notice that I've got a couple of misplaced holes. Mostly because I'm a dummy. So just be careful where you're drilling. I'm just trying to hide the screws on the inside where possible. After you drive that one screw, check your alignment. I've got a center line here that looks to be pretty perfect, so we can go ahead and apply the second screw. Now, if you look down here, I've got a little bit of extra material with my spacer block in there, and I do want to try to get this thing to conform. Uh, these pieces are moving. It's, it's just the way southern yellow pine is going to go. So what I'm going to do is take a clamp, and I'm going to clamp from up here to the foot and try to get that so that it's nice and even. This is just a temporary clamping situation here. Just scooching it there until I have a nice flush alignment. We'll look at that. Then we can drive the screws and we're good to go. How's that? Noise! This is totally one of those projects where if you're not careful, you could put a leg on the wrong face. You could very easily um, just kind of get turned around and put the extra foot on the wrong side. So just pay careful attention, make sure everything's lined up. Uh, we have another one of these to make. So this guy we could put on the side, same process to build the other side. All right, next up, we're gonna bring these two long side assemblies or front and back assemblies, and we will then attach cross pieces to connect them. Now, here's the thing. These pieces have moved. This is definitely not uh, dead flat. We've got some twists to deal with. So as we bring these pieces together, what we're kind of hoping for is that it will sort of make everything conform to the shape that we want. So everything is, you know, flat enough, square enough, straight enough. So I am going to start clamping these all in position dry. We're gonna get the two on this side and two on that side, clamp them in dry just to make sure everything's locked in place. And then one at a time, we'll take it apart, add the glue and drive the screws. Your hand is not a hammer, except when it is. Okay, so I'll start with this guy up here. Loosen my clamp. Of course, you want to be flush with the top of your legs. You see something you can clamp out. Go ahead and do it. I'm not good at drilling at odd angles. Okay, that's pretty good. So now we're just gonna go to each set of clamps, remove the piece, add the glue, screw it in place. Now on the top, I'm gonna to add two additional dividers. I think these are good for support for the top. They're also gonna give us something to screw through to attach our actual top. And these little pieces, they're the same length as our side rails. So if you have a gap, you're gonna to wanna to use a clamp to squeeze those together. But I have my marks here, just kind of you know dividing this thing evenly. It's not really super crucial, but I could line up those center marks together on both sides, and then we'll be able to clamp these two in place and drive screws from the outside. So we've got the clampies and the glue. What's wrong, Pine? You yellow? Nobody calls me yellow. Woo-hoo. Booyah! Next. Oh, boy. Bada bing, bada boom. That's looking pretty good. All 
Right about here. Yeah. All right, so we got the base here in the approximate location where it's gonna go. Of course, concrete floors are not gonna be dead flat. So if you've done everything correctly and you had mostly straight pieces and you see that some of your legs aren't touching, we got six points of contact here. If something's not touching, there's a good chance it's just because the floor is not flat. So in our case, I'm pretty confident having done the jointing and the ripping of these pieces. I know these edges are pretty straight, so I'm confident that if I see a lift, it's because the floor is just out of flat. So if you take a look down here, both this center leg and the one at the rear are sitting above the concrete. And when I lay a straight edge across here, I know that I've got a little bit of a dip there. So if this were the final place for this, I'm gonna shim and make sure that I do have good contact with the ground. Otherwise, when we start putting weight on the top, we might very well you know, force this down to make contact which could then cause a dip in our top. All right, so speaking of the top, that's gonna to be next. We're gonna do a couple layers of plywood and probably some formica on the top, so that'll be pretty fun. But the base at this point is done. After these messages, we'll be right back. So the Fremont King Size Bed. This completes the series for the Wood Whisperers Guild on the Fremont Bedroom Suite. I've previously done videos on my Fremont Chester drawers and Fremont nightstand. This project is a little different than those. I built this as I normally do any project in my shop. In other words, I use things like the CNC and the multi-router, but you get to see how a project normally flows through my shop. For those of you who have CNC, this is a project you've been waiting for. If you are interested in CNC, you can see how it integrates into the workflow. I will be releasing the DXF file so you can build along or have someone cut out the parts for you. It's a little different too in the fact that there are no square ebony pegs. There are inlays, kind of takes the place of pegs. The little inlays telegraph off their given shapes. It was a very fun project for me to build. I hope it will be for you too. Hope to see you over at the Guild. All right, so next up, we're gonna start working on the top and also the shelf. And that means we have to think about the sheet goods we're using for this. Now for the bottom shelf, I don't think it really matters. I don't know for sure what we're doing with that shelf. So for now, I have a piece of half inch MDF. It's like the cheapest thing I could find. It's nice and flat. It should work just fine there. Now the top, I'm using plywood and this was very much overpriced plywood, unfortunately, but that's all I have access to. Now you could use things like subfloor material, OSB, uh, particle board, and even MDF. Uh, what we're gonna do is cover this up so it really doesn't matter. The key is it needs to be flat and it needs to be as inexpensive as you could reasonably get it. And this is the flattest stuff I had access to. Even the subfloor material that we saw there just looked in bad shape and it didn't look like something I would want as the core for this top. If we start off nice and flat, then it's probably gonna stay flat, especially if we put these pieces down on top of the base and we check it for flatness. We'll see where we are. I got a straight edge here. And when I drop this guy on there, I'm not gonna get my feeler gauges out for something like this, but when I sight across that straight edge, and when I rotate this around, I don't have any high spots, no major low spots. That is good enough for woodworking, right? So you wanna check in multiple places. And you know, we haven't screwed these two pieces together, so we don't really quite have everything where it's gonna be, but this will give you an idea if you are dealing with a mostly flat surface, and that looks pretty good to me. So our next step is to lay out a grid work for a whole bunch of screws. We're gonna glue and screw these two pieces together. Gee, dick. This may seem like overkill, but it really does help to get even screw placement, and it only takes a few minutes. The top piece gets a countersink at every point. And it's important that the pre-drilled hole is big enough to let the screw pass through without grabbing, since our goal is for the screw head to grab the top sheet and pull the two sheets together. That's so many screws. Now for the glue. So for something like this, you're probably best off having multiple people if you can, and you certainly don't want to use a brush for this. It'll take too long. A roller is really the way to go. Holy crap, Jason. <laughs> That's a lot of glue. Now we're only going to put glue on one side for expedience. I mean, if you have the time and the means, go ahead, put it on both sides. But for our purposes, with all those screws, putting it on one side is probably enough. Jeez Louise. Uh -huh. 
And we're gonna cut the edges off so they don't have to be dead on. Send it home. All right, so I hate to do this to you, but we gotta do a little bit of math because in order to get this Formica sheet uh, to sit on the surface and not have the base of that material be too wide, too long, we gotta think about these numbers here. We gotta make some cuts. So the Formica comes 48 by 96. It actually is a little bit oversized and we need that extra just because we want some wiggle room with the placement and we want a little bit of an overhang that we could flush up later. So let's just call that Formica 48 by 96 even. Our plywood, depends on where you get it in the manufacturer, could be anywhere from a four by eight to slightly over. So we have to figure out how much to cut away if we're also going to trim the outside edge with some hardwood. So here's the way I look at it. You got three quarter inch hardwood on all sides. So I think in terms of one side three quarter, the other three quarter, that's an inch and a half. And if our final target with the trim on there is gonna be 48 inches, we would say 48 minus an inch and a half means 46 and a half inches. So the cuts we're gonna do now will trim this to 46 and a half inches wide. Then we can apply our three quarter inch trim and the final number will be 48. You can do the same math for the length with 96. We subtract an inch and a half, we end up with 94 and a half, which is our final dimension after cutting. And then again, we apply our three quarter inch trim. And then this final should be pretty close to 48 by 96, giving us plenty of room to take our Formica sheet drop that sucker on there. All right, to make these cuts, I'm gonna use a track saw. If you don't have a track saw, you could certainly use a regular circular saw with some kind of a straight edge. You can make them yourself out of just, you know, leftover sheet goods. Uh, you just want a pretty straight line all the way across, and we're gonna clean up all four of these edges. Let's flip it, flip it good. Oh God, it's just two pieces of plywood. That's it. What's so bad? It's the ash. Plus glue, screws, and the ash trim. All right, next up, we need to apply that protective surface on top of the assembly table. So what I have here is a big old sheet of Formica. Uh, it's black because I think it looks cool, but you can go with any color. We can make this thing look like marble if we wanted to. I've got it laid out here so that we could apply our contact cement. And this process, well, it's a bit of a process and you do need a couple of tools to do it. So let me show you the stuff I've got gathered to get this job done. All right, so here are the things that we need. Of course, we need to apply the contact cement very quickly. Now this is just weld wood, standard old contact cement. I got a roller here with a very thin nap roller on there, which will allow us to spread the glue nice and consistently and quickly. And of course a tray for that as well. This stuff is pretty nasty. It'll knock you on your butt in a hurry. So a good respirator with good filtration, you definitely want something like that. I've got plastic and a couple of sticks here. You're gonna see how we use these in a minute, but think about it, you got a big four by eight sheet, two sticky surfaces that once they touch, they're not coming apart. So how do you make sure you get that placed properly and very carefully? Well, these are gonna help us with that. And finally, we got a J roller. A J roller has a name for an obvious reason. It's in the shape of a J, but it is also a very heavy duty roller that has a long handle allowing you to put a lot of pressure down. And we're gonna use this to push out any of the air from under that laminate sheet. All right, let's give it a try. While I apply the contact cement, I should mention that a great alternative to this kind of laminate top is melamine. That's what I used on my outfeed table and it worked great. The problem is I really prefer black colored melamine and I couldn't find that anywhere here locally, which is why I'm going with Formica. If you wanna go with melamine, be sure to check out my outfeed assembly table video. It'll definitely save you a few bucks. Okay, with the contact cement applied to both surfaces, we now use the plastic and two sticks to execute a very cool trick that I learned from Frank at Carpenter13 on Instagram. Instead of using a bunch of sticks and pulling them out one at a time, we could lay a plastic sheet on a surface that prevents the two surfaces from bonding and just have two sticks at the end that are directly on the contact cement. Once we have the laminate in the perfect position, we could remove the sticks and start the bonding process. Now, once we're locked in position, we could fold back the sheet to remove the plastic film and then slowly let the sheet down, bonding as we go. 
If you've had trouble in the past with uh, the dowel and the stick method, this might be a good alternative. To ensure good contact, of course, we hit the surface with a J roller. I then use a flush trim bit to trim the excess laminate. And finally, hit the edge with a light chamfer. With the top centered, we can secure it to the base with screws. For now, we'll slice up that MDF and drop it in as a shelf, though you'll see ultimately I went with a different direction down there. Yes. We also decided to add a couple of leveling feet to the center legs and some workbench casters for mobility. I know how it feels. Now with our top done, you might be wondering about possibly balancing the other side with another sheet of laminate. I mean, when we're talking about things like veneer, you certainly want to put veneer on both sides, otherwise you could wind up with a cupped panel. Can the same thing happen here with a Formica surface? You know, I haven't done a ton of these. I guess it's a possibility. I can tell you, we put that first layer on and really didn't see much change. We did wind up with just a little bit of an out of flat surface, but that could have happened just because of the way that we glued the two pieces together. So I'm not 100% sure, but just to be safe, we flipped it over. We put another sheet of Formica on the other side. Here's the other thing because of those holes that we had from all of those screws, which we didn't fill, there is technically a possibility if we drop something really heavy and it lands right on one of those spaces where the holes are that it could actually penetrate through the Formica. So just something to think about. Anyway, we put this other piece of Formica on here and we don't see a whole lot of change. And I do wanna show you where we are with regard to uh, the flatness of this surface. So here's my Lee Valley Straight Edge, one of the aluminum jobbies. And what I ended up with in my top is a slight smile, a little bit of a cup. And the amount of gap I have here, not a lot. I would estimate it's about a 64th of an inch across this entire four foot surface. So, I mean, you might have work where that matters, but I could tell you with everything I build, it just doesn't. Most of what I'm concerned about is what might fit within, let's say a two foot section. And when you look at that across this length, you know, it's for all intents and purposes, it's dead flat. And if I take this section, kind of dead flat, right? So this is why I'm not too concerned. I don't really have anything that truly will reference across this entire four, four foot length. And even if it did, the error is only about a 64th of an inch. Lengthwise, we're looking at about the same thing. And I've got this little white card here. Doesn't really fit. I eh, probably convinced it to go under there. This thing is pretty darn thin. Um, so across this full length, it's really not bad either. And again, it's the two footer that really tells the story in terms of what might matter to me. Right, and this is good enough. So no, is this you know torsion box flat? It's not, but it's definitely flat enough for my work. And truth be told, when it comes to torsion box builds, you put a lot of work and effort into them, and there is still a possibility that it's not gonna be dead flat. Don't ask me how I know, but I have certainly heard from many people who will go through all the steps, they seemingly did everything correctly, but they still end up with a tiny, maybe about a 64th of an inch flaw in the surface, which really sucks after you put that much effort into it, which is why I just don't do it anymore. All right, so the next thing we need to do is start to accessorize the base. We have a lot of opportunity to store stuff here, and we're gonna start with some clamps. I'll cut down some quarter inch ply to fit between the legs as panels. I'll then make some little custom brackets to hold pipes that will serve as hangers for clamps. And I'm really just kind of freestyling here with the size and shape of these pieces. Next, I can cut the pipe down to length so that it fits between the brackets in two sections. And now we can load her up. All right, now we started with a simple bottom here. This can just be a shelf that you could put stuff on 
Uh, nothing wrong with that. But I wanted to do something a little more. Part of the thing that we would have trouble with is with this overhang, it might be difficult to get to stuff that's in the back. So I thought it might be fun to actually have a slide out tray. To do this though, I need to make sure that I have the weight capacity to handle just about anything I wanna put on there. And I don't even know what's gonna go there. So I wanna make sure that we have uh, the ability to put the heavy stuff there. So this, this might be the biggest drawer slide I've ever seen. All right, these are heavy duty slides rated at 500 pounds. They're obviously much more beefy than what we're used to. And I've looked at this for about 10 minutes. Uh, Jason looked at it. We can't figure out how to get this piece off the way that you normally would for a drawer slide like this. And I don't think it comes off and it might be because of the higher weight capacity. It's built in such a way that it isn't removable. <laughs> I may be wrong there, but we're gonna install it assuming that it is not removable. The idea is we get that bottom panel out of there because with two trays, we don't really need a bottom. The trays are effectively the bottom and we're going to attach these to our sides. Now, the trick is we need to have something to screw into and we kind of have gaps on all these sides and especially here in the middle, there's nothing for it to go onto. So it's gonna rest on these rails. That's gonna give us the support against gravity, but then we're gonna have a couple of glue blocks added to our legs and added to the back. We need six of these to get the job done. These are just two pieces glued together and screwed and then we're gonna attach them on the inside. It's just surface in which the slide can rest on that we could drive our screws into. While I start working on the trays, Jason adds our screw blocks. They're just glued and screwed in place. I'll make the tray signs from white oak. The joints will be simple reinforced rabbits. The bottom panel needs to support a lot of weight, so I'll make that from 3 quarter inch plywood, which means we need a 3 quarter inch groove all the way around the inside of the tray. To assemble, I'll add glue to all of the joints and the panel groove. and then check for square. A corner to corner clamp works great for making little adjustments. For the reinforcement, I'll add some dowels to each joint. Now I'm gonna let my slides rest on the bottom frame of the base, so I need the tray to sit a little bit higher. When I mark and drill my holes, I'll prop the tray up on some quarter inch plywood so that I've got the spacing that I need. Now I can take the drawer side of the slide, keeping it flush with the front and trace the screw hole locations. I won't use them all, but this gives me some options. I then use one screw to immobilize the slide temporarily while I trace the holes at the back of the slide. I plan to use about four to five screws on each side and I'll just pre-drill at this point. So that's one side. We're gonna repeat the process on the other side. And of course now, the front of my tray is here. In a similar fashion, we'll mark the hole locations in the base using the slide itself. The slide just rests on the base with the front of the slide flush with the front leg. I use a little block to help stop the slide while I trace the screw locations at the front and the back. To attach the slides, I'll use one inch screws. Okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> now to install the trays, I'll use some of the same quarter inch ply that we used as a spacer before and put that on the base to help support the tray. Things are still a bit wonky, but thankfully we know that we can trust those pre-drilled holes and we could force the tray into the correct position. That looks good. I'm gonna lay in it and you're gonna push me in. You ready? Here we go. Ready? Yep. It's up your ass, son. Yeah, well, it's only going in so far. Oh! <laughs> oh yeah. Does it work? 
<laughs> no, because my head's in the way. Oh. I'm hitting the back panel oh. with my head. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, boss. <laughs> Jason's opportunity for revenge. Okay, uh -huh. I'm convinced that it will hold some weight. That's like three Cremonas in there. <laughs> so with the trays in place, I think the last thing we're gonna do is address the storage on the side here. Now, there's quite a few things you can do. Um, I think the great thing about this build is there's a lot of room to accessorize it however you want. What I was originally going to do was use this area here just kind of have these as support boards for pegboard. And I was just gonna cut a sheet that would fit between the legs. But then Jason mentioned, why don't we just go the full width? Because this part of this leg and this leg, it's not really doing anything for me. And if I can't store anything in that spot, then what's the point? So what I'm gonna do instead is build a simple pegboard frame, right? So just a piece of pegboard with a simple frame around the outside, that'll help it stand off that three quarters of an inch that we need for pegboard accessories. And now I'm actually gonna have the full width of this base or the full depth of the base for extra storage. And who doesn't want extra storage? This, boom baby. Well, I cannot express enough how excited I am to have a big assembly table in the shop again. I've actually never had a four by eight. I used to work in a shop back in Phoenix that uh, they had one and it was an absolute pleasure and I'm super stoked to have it here. The base on this thing is really where all the magic happens. I mean, of course we're assembling on the top, but all this extra storage that you get here, the sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want to do. So the trays, the pegboard, the clamps on the back, that's all just the starting point. And you could really use your imagination to come up with something that is just customized for your personal needs. These trays support all the weight for anything I could possibly want to put on there. Of course, the pegboard, well, pegboard's pegboard. You could do whatever you need in terms of uh, different accessories and hanging whatever you need from there. And then just those pipes on the back with the clamps is incredibly versatile. You could put whatever clamps you need back there, or maybe you have another idea. You don't even want clamps there. Do whatever you need to do. And of course, the mobility. I don't plan to move this very often. And I frankly, once it was loaded down, I doubted whether or not this would move very well. But Jason is more daring than I am, and he showed me that it moved just fine. Mobile. I don't plan to move it very frequently, but if we need to, that mobility is there and I don't have to offload everything to actually do that move, which is kind of nice. So there you go. Big giant assembly table. I hope you guys build one. We'll probably have a set of plans in case you want to build your own. But just keep in mind, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, whatever works for you and accessorize it to your needs. All right, thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time. That should do it. Did you hear that? That's all it was. <laughs> that was weak. Whoa, Jason. You wanna go turn that fan on? Oh, what are you doing over there? Now some like workplaces will have a swear jar. We're gonna have to get a fart jar. Creating a TWW sanctioned space for all employees to fart without judgment. Now we're gonna do a little bit of some, mm -hmm. giggity giggity. Okay, all right. Here we go. Uh, yep. Why'd you pick that height? Because it's perfect ball resting height. Here, let me give you some room. Oh, yeah, thanks for the two inches. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> <sighs> Dude. <laughs> Nipples hard? Check. <laughs>